Following the Civil War, American industry and business changed dramatically, grew and increased, and many immigrants came in. At the time of this great wealth, Samuel Clements, the writer better known as Mark Twain, described it as being the Gilded Age. Gilded means a base metal beneath on top covered with gold. So why did he call it that? We'll look at that in this lecture. In the late 19th and early 20th century, you saw corporations develop in new ways. Now, there were been corporations for a long time, but the modern concept and what we think of today as a corporation didn't really begin until after the American Civil War. And railroad companies were often the pioneers of new forms of organization and corporate stock and bond selling. Selling stocks become the primary way to raise money for businesses following the Civil War. Before that, usually it was individual investors or people who outright own companies. But because railroads cost so much, because you had the rolling stock, it was the boxcars and shipping containers, engines, you had to have rails and you had to build roads, uh, railroads, for the trains to travel on. So there was a tremendous amount of capital needed, and it was more than one or a few people could gather, and so they needed to sell stock. Also, the new idea of a corporation provided some protection for stockholders uh, by limiting their liability. They would only risk what they invested, not their entire life savings, uh, like you might do in a company where everything you own is then held uh, in case you bank go bankrupt. But in a limited liability issue, it's only the stock, only your investment that's at risk. So some of these characteristics was that railroads were becoming large national businesses. And so uh, you couldn't have just one person running some of these corporations. You needed to develop this idea of middle managers. And this starts in the railroad corporations. They also need large amounts of money, and they looked at new forms of consolidating power. Two primary ways, one through horizontal integration and another through vertical integration. And horizontal integration, this meant that you owned similar companies horizontally. You might own several refineries. So you were owning corporations or owning companies along similar types of businesses. In vertical integration, however, uh, and this started in the 1890s, you were controlling up and down the line. So if you had a railroad company, you might also own a steel company. You might also own a communications, a telegraph company. So these are businesses associated and sometimes serving your primary business, but uh, you would control the cost. You would control the overhead. You would control the profit. And so you wouldn't be making too much money off of services you needed because if you own those companies, it was just going back into the bigger corporation. So horizontal and vert vertical integration were two new forms of business structure. And we see this in people like Andrew Carnegie, who started off a Scottish immigrant who came to the United States, and he worked uh, as a telegraph operator, uh, running the telegraph for railroads. He took his money and he invested in a steelworks in 1873, and within a few years became one of the richest men in the world. He used vertical integration, and so he owned not only the steel companies, but maybe the smeltering plants, the mines from which the steel ore was taken, the iron ore was taken. And so he would own everything up and down the lines. And he also controlled railroad companies to the extent that he shipped a lot on railroads. And so he asked for discounts and paybacks. And this was called rebates. So he would get money back because he shipped so much on these railroads. Now, he sold out eventually to J. Pierpont Morgan, and Pierpont Morgan took the Carnegie Steelworks and created United States Steel Corporation, which within a few years became the largest, most powerful steel business 
in the United States and may be one of the largest in the world. $1.4 billion of assets and control much of United States steel production. Another industrialist of the era was John David Rockefeller. Rockefeller, like Carnegie, started off very modestly. He worked for a produce company, a grocery company, but after the Civil War, he took his money and he invested in a refinery, an oil, petroleum refinery in Cleveland, and this turned into Standard Oil Company. And soon, he, practicing horizontal integration, took control of other refineries in Cleveland. Now, he was using horizontal integration there, but he also expanded vertically. So he would own the company that made the steel barrels. He would own, uh, had interest in railroads. And his company, Standard Oil, became the leading monopoly, not only of petroleum, but the leading monopoly of bi the business world by the 1890s. As a result, you do see the concentration of power in the hands of a few people. You have the rich getting richer. And so this idea of this 1%, 1% of the United States corporations controlled one-third of the manufacturing. Now think about that for a few minutes. And think about how much power was concentrated in the business world at that time. And you also have the rise of industrial giants like Rockefeller, your Carnegie's, Morgan's, as I've mentioned, but others as well. And so there was tremendous industrial growth in the United States driving the U.S. economy, and it really took advantage of mass production. There were other forms of business organization developed during this period. You had pools, and pools were agreements uh, to stabilize rates and divide markets. And how they did this was by gathering together pools of, like, airline agencies. Like, if you got all the airlines, companies, United, Southwest, and others, together, controlled together, and that way um, you could manage competition because you didn't really have any competition. You could set prices. You could divide markets. This company is going to focus on this area. This company is going to focus on this area. And it made a lot of sense economically. You also had the development of trusts. Now, trusts were where stockholders uh, took stock from other corporations and put them in basically a large pool. Uh, and in, in exchange, uh, you're going to turn over 50% of your shares for Standard Oil. You're going to get it in, I don't know, uh, XYZ Petroleum. And then we're going to give you back in exchange trust in the major company, in the stockholding company. Way of combining businesses, limiting competition, and controlling prices. And there was the development of holding companies. Uh, and again, this is the late 19th century creation. And that corporations could buy other corporations. They could hold other businesses and thereby control. And again, it was all about competition. It was all about economy. It was all about reducing um, the amount of competition you would have because you could control the market. Uh, you could uh, diversify and cut up the market. And that you could control prices. So, this created a problem. A lot of people saw big business as corrupt. And this is a very famous uh, cartoon from Puck Magazine from the late 1880s. And it's called The Bosses of the Senate. And so, in this cartoon, what you see is uh, the U.S. Senate there, uh, members in the first three rows, and their bosses watching over them. Uh, are large corporate trusts. So you have the Copper Trust, the Steel B, the Iron Trust, Standard Oil, and other trusts watching over the Senate. And they are shaped like bags of money. And so this gave you an idea, saw power and politics and business in the late 1880s. And if you look up in the uh, rafters in the so-called gallery of the Senate where visitors come in, the door is barred and closed. Um, and it says uh, people's uh, control, and that's people's entrance, and that's blocked off. And uh, there's a sign at the back that says, trust the Senate. Uh, this is the Senate. Monopolists by the monopolists and for the 
monopolists. So the idea is that, you know, business is controlling government uh, and has control of the Senate. And so, you know, it, it was a joke. And, and you hear similar jokes today. So this started back in the 1890s. On the other hand, and unions in an effect were an attempt to create a combination of workers, a kind of pooling together workers who were fighting for better wages, shorter hours, uh, safer conditions. And it made more sense to combine their efforts than to work individually. In 1866, so right after the Civil War, America entered a panic. And a panic is what we would call today a depression. So this is the panic of 1873. Labor unions were involved. And the big labor union at the time was the National Labor Union. It was really more of a reform group rather than a laborer. But you also did have some unions, which were more like in fraternal organizations, the Molly Maguires, the ancient Order of Hiberians, was really an Irish social fraternal organization, but they got involved in helping a lot of their people who were Irish, who were immigrants, and who worked in coal mining in Pennsylvania, this anthracite coal mining. Uh, they got a bad reputation because uh, along with them came a lot of violence. They intimidated people who didn't agree with them, and so um, this type of union took on uh, a bad name, as it were. In 1877, just a few years later, the Great Railroad Strike. And what strikers were complaining about was pay cuts. And there was a lot of violence, there was a lot of destruction. Uh, the railroads brought in militia, hired guns, uh, private security to stop the strike. And in West Virginia, a hundred people were killed in conflicts. And this is a uh, illustration uh, from a newspaper, from a magazine of the time, uh, showing uh, a fire and blaming it on the Union, which they were probably responsible for, at least because of the conflict. So it wasn't totally unfounded, but uh, it was a little one-sided. They were looking at the violence caused by the Union and ignoring the violence uh, that the owners, the business owners, uh, contributed to. And so many people saw that unions were going to be the cause of conflict, and this weakened the power of the unions. And why did they remain weak, though? Well, again, let's look at the kind of the attitudes of the time. Organized labor conflicted with the predominant ideas of social Darwinism. And this was the idea of survival of the fittest. And so we believed, it was very popular to believe at that time, that uh, you know, the, the best survive, the most capable people were the ones who rose in society, and that if you were on the lower rungs of society, it was because there was something inherently wrong with you. And so by organizing labor and uh, fighting for the rights, this seemed to fly in the face of what social Darwinism taught, is that, you know, the weak were weak because they deserved to be weak. It was kind of circular thinking. And that it was anti-competition. And so people didn't like that, uh, you know, you had these collective efforts that people banding together to raise wages. Why don't you fight for wages for yourself and not for other people? And they didn't like the fact that government sometimes stepped in to help. Now, that doesn't mean government was always on the side of labor. In fact, most times they weren't. But any type of government activity was seen as an intrusion. So whether or not they were regulating the economy or helping the unions, it was still seen as a threat by many people. And so unions threatened this idea of a free marketplace of employment, and so many people were against that. 